poems are seem seem fragile things. If you change a word, they're broken. And yet, in fact, they outlive whole civilizations. I think it's absolutely singular, really, in tra tracking right through from classical poetry, I mean, you know, Virgil, Horace, Ovid and so on, uh, and, and into um, right up to now, really, um, in, in modern terms, um, and, um, and including European poetry. Yes, I do think it's absolutely singular. I don't know another, another anthology like it. So it is very difficult choosing a single poem, poem from a great poet. Um, Shakespeare is an example of that, of course, and so is Keats. And in the end, I didn't choose one of the odes, but I chose a sonnet which he wrote for Fanny Bourne before he left, just before he left to Italy to, to die. It's called Bright Star. Bright Star, would I were steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendour, hung aloft the night, and watching with eternal lids apart, like nature's patient, sleepless eremite, the moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution round earth's mortal shores, or gazing on the new, soft-fallen mask of snow upon the mountains and the moors, no, yet still steadfast, still unchangeable, pillowed upon my fair love's ripening breast, to feel forever its soft fall and swell, awake forever in a sweet unrest, still, still to hear her tender taken breath, and so live ever, or else swoon to death. I think it's quite right that I am inhabited by poems. That's to say they spring to mind all the time, all the time, um, in, different, in different ways, different kinds of poetry. Um, I'm thinking particularly of, of a, again, a poet called W.H. Davis, who was a tramp <laughs> and a hobo in America, um, took part in the Klondike Gold Gold Rush, lost a leg trying to hitch a lift on a train. W. H. Davis, and he writes, uh, I, to me, an unforgettable poem called The Inquest, where he was brought in as I think, the jury men to do an inquest on a four-month-old baby girl um, who had clearly been killed by the mother. I mean, the mother made no bones about it. And they were instructed by the coroner to say, the, this discharge by misadventure met her death. They all agree, but the but Davis writes about the child smile, looking up at him with one eye, saying, "Perhaps my mother murdered me," and I can't get that poem out of my mind. Actually, I think it's for learning about world poetry. I would have been really delighted when I was an undergraduate to have this book put into my hand. I really would. Um, uh, because, you know, undergraduate courses are so narrow, really, um, particularly in those days. And this opens your eyes to, well, I hope, would open almost anyone's eyes to things they didn't know. Another thing that uh, I, I enjoyed when writing, when, when composing it, was uh, how I found myself reassessing Victorian poetry. Victorian poetry has had rather short shrift from T.S. Eliot and F.R. Leavis and so on, of being sentimental and so on. I, on the contrary, has found, I mean, Tennyson seems to be a magnificently great poet. Uh, and actually, Matthew Arnold. Matthew Arnold has a poem which I include uh, called Dover Beach, uh, which he wrote on his honeymoon, um, looking out a, across the straits. Um, and he, he says to his, to, to, to his wife, O oh love, let us be true to one another. 
for this world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor light, nor love, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept by confused alarms of struggle and flight, while ignorant armies clash by night. Things haven't changed, have they? I was very determined to get as many women into the anthology as I could. And one of my favourite poems, which I'll read in a minute, is about an unknown woman writing about an unknown woman. Um, but I, I, it seems to me what I've just said about the Victorian period is true of women. I mean, Christina Rossetti and Charlotte Mew, a practically unknown poet, the new life of her has just come out. But um, she writes a, a poem um, called The Farmer's Bride, about a man, a farmer, who speaks in a rustic voice, who has married a woman who is terrified of sex. Um, and it's a wonderful poem because it's told by the farmer, but you don't take sides as you do always in Browning's monologues, you know, you always know which side Browning is on. Um, not here. It's just deeply, deeply painful about both of them. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I think I go for feeling. Um. So this is a poem about the London Blitz and it's about a woman whom no one knows anything about um, and it's by a woman whom no one knows anything about. I like it partly because I was a child in the Blitz and so I dimly remember the kind of thing that it's being written about. After all these years, I can still close my eyes and see her sitting there in her big armchair, grotesque under an open sky framed by the jagged lines of her broken house. Sitting there, a plump, homely person Steel needles still in her work rough hands, grey with dust, stiff with shock, but breathing, no blood or distorted limbs, breathing, but stiff with shock, knitting, unravelling on her aproned knee. They have taken the stretchers off my car, and I am running under the pattering flack, that's shrapnel falling, over a mangled garden, treading on something soft and fighting the rising nausea because it's only a far-flung cushion bleeding feathers. They lift her gently out of her great armchair, tenderly under the open sky, a shock frozen woman, trailing khaki wool, so she's knitting socks for soldiers. Yeah, I think one thing you discover from doing this kind of anthology is how poetry still talks to you, um, even though it was written centuries and centuries ago. It's the same with Homer, but particularly with Sappho, who writes about much more about the kind of thing we write about nowadays, about love, not particularly about warfare and adventure, but about love. Uh, hardly any of her poetry survives. It was just read to death, as it were. Um, tremendously popular. She was called the poetess and Homer the poet. You know, she, she was considered the equal of Homer. Um, but hardly any survives. And this poem I'm going to read is called Fragment 31. Um, and and it, it, it occurred, she, she of course uh, was in love with a woman, um, and it describes her shock when she sees the woman she loves talking and laughing with a man. Um, and the, the, the expression of shock 
is is the first um, is the first surviving literary um, expression of of female passion. So she's, she looks at this man and she says, he is more than a hero, he is a god in my eyes, the man who is allowed to sit beside you, he who listens minutely to the sweet murmur of your voice, the enticing laughter that makes my own heart beat fast. If I meet you suddenly, I can't speak. My tongue is broken. A thin flame runs under my skin. Seeing nothing, hearing only my own ears drumming, I drip with sweat, trembling shakes my body, and I turn paler than dry grass. At such times, death isn't far from me. I hope um, that people will find in, in the anthology um, poems that stay with them for life.